For the Innovative and Established Practices module, I worked on three projects. One focused on storytelling, followed by a film worked on as a group with established roles, and finally, a solo experimental film. This resulted in a script titled Syncopation, a seven-minute film based on this script, and a five-minute experimental film that I called A Scout's Guide to Water. The permeating focus of these exercises was to reflect on established approaches to filmmaking by both me and by artistically celebrated or industry-decorated practitioners. Progressing through my working with an awareness of these tendencies would allow for introspection on my personal preferences as a filmmaker, as well as an evaluation of how conducive standard practices are for quality filmmaking. With script writing, I aimed to come to a conclusion on what kind of stories I wanted to tell. The first project became an exercise of finding my artistic voice and understanding how it may vary from established approaches. This became the catalyst for my area of research that ran in tandem with my filmmaking exercises. My first research presentation focused on the institutional failings of film history in regard to correcting injustices and inequalities. This largely informed my approach to the second project, the first of my submitted materials, the group film. In opening my script up to a team of creatives after cultivating such a specific vision, I was now giving large concern to how pivotal my ego was in my decisions in compromising and collaborating. Having found a motivating research topic and developing an existing idea by a new methodology, I moved on to the experimental film, ready to completely invert my approach. I wanted to refute my desire for complex and impressive concepts, as well as the ingrained idea that something is captured by film. I approached the task of my second submission with an understanding there would be no reshoots or second guesses, at least until the first instance of the group feedback. This was to serve as a chance to see how ingrained my recent lesson in breaking from established practices had become, and whether I could produce quality work in a new way. By the end of my reflection, I hope to have shown the process of my work from each exercise's prompt until submission, as well as go on to commend or condemn the resulting work by how well it served my purposes. Ultimately, I hope to give a conclusive critique of my performance and establish my next step with an informed trajectory. As a writer, I don't find much gratification in, for lack of a less condescending term, simple narratives. The comfort of predictable narratives rooted in convention absolutely has their value and validity, a Christmas rom-com in December offers familiar journey, aesthetic and tone that serves culturally as seasonal set dressing and psychologically as a year-end meditative wind-down. This is a concept explained in S. Brent Rodriguez Plate's article for Popside.com. When people see some part of their own lives unfold on screen, the act of viewing operates in a fashion that's strikingly similar to how a religious ritual works. It's with respect, not rejection, that I err away from simplicity, though. As an exercise, I'm happy to try it. In Beth McCann's writer workshop, we were asked to make a page of script showing the expression of I love you without it as explicit dialogue. I produced this. Exterior by garden day. A bright summer afternoon. An ice cream truck leaves earshot as two siblings, younger eight and older ten, return. Each has a cone of ice cream and a smile. A momentary approach from a wasp startles the younger enough to make them drop their cone onto the grass. Welling up, they look from the lost scoop to their sibling. Instinctively, Older offers their entire cone. Beat. Younger rushes inside, coming back out with a plastic plate and knife. Younger sits, requests the ice cream and scrapes half onto the plate before returning the cone. Older sits alongside their sibling and swaps their portions, jamming the knife into the plated half as a makeshift cone. The two eat, watching ants gathered on the fallen scoop. I am superficially proud of this. I do feel it fulfills the task, however I don't find it interesting to read or rewarding to write. To me, it feels like a buffet of low-hanging fruit, uses of imagery as trite as children, ice cream, sharing and smiles to evoke love in my mind becomes equal to using a slot machine that lets me move each wheel freely by hand. What was once a flashy and exciting exploration of trial and error becomes a mechanical process of easy and obvious choices. I recognise the century of established conventions in traditional storytelling and script writing, but, possibly symptomatic of the media's supersaturated Gen Z upbringing, or my ADHD encumbered patience and attention span, I feel a compulsion to drink from Marcel Duchamp's fountain of absurdism. In a later narrative exercise, Beth had the class develop a story from an image of a rural UK village. Each individual student would employ their ethos of improv theatre to yes and an incremental contribution. This resulted in a narrative with a comical resemblance to Frankenstein's monster, a goal of spectacular achievement and creation, recognizably adhering to an understood conventional form, 
clashing with the patchwork methodology of far too many contributors to result in a bastardization that retroactively calls for the creator to self-reflect on academic pursuits. The final iteration became a story of a high libido girlfriend and a virgin boyfriend receiving a box containing the still living severed head of who is recognized as a prostitute hired to deflower the boyfriend by request of the partner to solve their relational rut. The narrative continues to the aforementioned rural town where a culture of ritual and tradition involving spinning lambs and trees sprouting lottery balls throws the trio into conflict, finally resolving with the boyfriend becoming comfortable with asexuality and the former girlfriend in an open lesbian relationship with the severed head. This was my satisfyingly bizarre evolution of the Frankenstein concept from class. I endeavoured to cohesively unite the eclectic components and flesh out a central narrative theme. From this stage in development, my storytelling project became the Frankenstein concept. However, Dr. Frankenstein is not a great role model for one's creative process. I soon felt as if I too would result in a soulless husk born of a fixation of could I over should I. I felt like I had hit the other end of my creative tolerance. The ice cream story was far too simple that it didn't spark engagement and the Frankenstein concept was so excessively complex it felt embarrassingly self-congratulating to pursue it. Ultimately, my solution was to think back to another Beth McCann writing workshop from my undergraduate and the script that was drafted in a day. This was a romance-based story of two dating music students who, via coming into conflict with their polar opposite approaches to music taste and production, realise simultaneously that their album as a duo as well as their romantic relationship are best ended and moved on from. Within the limited time frame, second guessing and simplicity or overindulging in the absurd was avoided. The result was a solid script, but still lacking in the whimsy I'm enthused by. In further days of work, I decided that I would expand the story to leak into the meta text, as the characters textually give up on their album and subtextually do the same for their relationship. The film's narrative itself mimicked a clamoring struggle to reconcile normalcy. Post breakup, the continuity of time and space, then of character and mise en scène, and then a visual style and production quality, all becoming progressively altered before the boyfriend falls into an empty void of abstract imagery. This not only included my desired bizarre elements, but also kept them at arm's length, and their inclusion being monitored to ensure moderation in their use. This was the version of the script I carried with me into the next exercise. In beginning my research, I became enthusiastic to address what I saw as institutional problems in the film industry. I presented to the class a chronology of notable historical moments in film, starting at Edward Muybridge's Horse in Motion, with a specific fixation on the motives behind its production and Muybridge's resulting career. Muybridge worked as a photographer hired by Leland Stanford to photograph the latter's property. He desired to have his newfangled technology used to immortalize the signifiers of wealth in which can only be assumed to be an ego-driven tantrum in the face of a metaphorical mother mortality. Muybridge obliged but fell short of satisfaction when photographing a horse. To appease the financier, an array of sequential cameras triggered consecutively successful captures of the horse in motion. It was photographed with such a time frame that when viewed in rapid succession, the illusion of motion was achieved. Chronophotography, and in turn filmmaking, was born at the behest of a rich man wishing to gloat. Moybridge would go on to a career of photographer and a penchant for name changes first changing the spelling of his name to resemble that of a past British king, before dropping all performance of modesty to work professionally as Helios, named for a Greek god. There was also an instance of Moybridge adopting the name Eduardo Santiago Moybridge while selling work in South America. All things considered, I feel fair in saying that film as a medium began from opportunistic and egocentric motivations. This was causally connected to a criticism of the contemporary film industry and its examples of this permeating effect of Moybridge's motivations, such as the blatant preferential treatment of the white western male filmmakers, in spite of their unmasked prejudice and predations. Stanley Kubrick's abuse of Shelley Duvall on the set of The Shining is an example of this. One article accounts, According to Duvall, the role was emotionally and physically exhausting, as she would have to coerce her body to be in a state of constant panic to appease the filmmaker's expectations regarding the character. Decades prior to this, Alfred Hitchcock showed even more dehumanizing attitudes towards star Tippi Hedren during production of The Birds. 
She allegedly spent five days filming the scene with live birds being thrown at her and attached to her body with elastic bands. Hedren says she broke down when a bird that had been attached to her shoulder almost pecked her in the eye, and she spent the following week in bed, exhausted. Hedren suspects that Hitchcock was attempting to punish her for rebuffing his sexual advances. Then bringing this history of abuse to the contemporary era of filmmakers, Quentin Tarantino has numerous instances of wielding the power he believes the position of director's chair affords him. For an interview with Parade magazine, Diane Kruger for Inglorious Bastards says, The funny part is that Quentin's hands are in the close-up. I won't give away the name of the actor who kills me, but Quentin said he's not going to do it right. It'll either be too much or too little. I know exactly what I need, and I think I should just do it. I have to say, it was very strange being strangled by the director. Then in 2018, Uma Thurman goes on Instagram to share unseen footage of a near-fatal stunt Tarantino insisted on her performing during the filming of Kill Bill, and an alleged cover-up following that. I post this clip to memorialise its full exposure in the New York Times by Maureen Dowd. The circumstances of this event were negligence to the point of criminality. For this, I hold Lawrence Bender, E. Bennett Walsh, and the notorious Harvey Weinstein solely responsible. They lied, destroyed evidence, and continue to lie about the permanent harm they caused and chose to suppress. All of this display of an attitude of abuse and predation is then followed by the predatory actions of filmmaker Roman Polanski, who after pleading guilty to the rape of a 13-year-old girl subsequently received a campaign of petitions signed by numerous industry figures for excusal of the crime by the Academy Awards. While Polanski was charged in 1977, any claims of reformation by the industry can be squashed by the systemic abuse and exploitation performed by Academy Award winner Harvey Weinstein that was brought to light by 85 women from 2002 continuing into the present day. It was this misogynistic, capitalist and white supremacist toxicity that I wish to reject in my development as a filmmaker of the aforementioned opportunistic egomaniacs racial, societal and gendered privileges. It's with this mindset that I approached working on my production crew for Syncopation. The story had a thematic focus on a woman as depicted in media. The girlfriend character would, during the film's bizarre narrative breakdown, regress into a more remedial depth of characterization before literally becoming objects in an attempt at satire. This was a large portion of the story during the personally favoured abrasively symbolic sequence during the end of the film. Yet, after a few discussions and reworks with the director, someone who has lived experience as a woman had me, someone without lived experience as a woman, nor a comprehensive education in the issues I touched upon, remove this aspect from the story. It put me in a mindset of remembering a relevant blog post from user Cassettes on Tumblr.com. I really like the advice, write marginalised characters, but don't write about marginalisation unless you experience it. Absolutely, I think cis people should expand their horizons and write trans characters, but they shouldn't write stories about being trans. Likewise, I think allistic neurotypical authors should write about autistic characters, but not stories about being autistic. Represent us, absolutely, but don't tell our stories, let us do that. This preening of what was necessary for the story led to a complete severance of the abstract sequence closing out the film. While I was disappointed to lose such a key attraction to the material, in retrospect, I believe the script as finalised before collaboration may not have been as balanced in shock and story as I previously assessed. I feel as if I may have been biting off more than I can chew, perhaps purposefully, in an instance of self-sabotage. This fixation on high concept, awesome visuals was likely an attempt of distracting audience, as would a magician's assistant, in an effort to disguise shoehorned superficial commentary on not only gender, but traditional storytelling that only truly served to stroke my ego with virtue signaling and an overly intellectual self-aggrandization. Opening up my script to become the shared work of my group only turned out to benefit the film, in my opinion. Without having my precious controlling vision, our DOP, Joseph Gabriel, was able to explore his personal interest of fixating on the minute elements of an actor's performance, i.e. the raise of a cheek, stutter of a reach, subconscious elements that so inescapably express something, some thing, to audiences. By surrendering the reins of direction to the much more ephemeral Lizzie Delahunt, they were able to approach performance and capture with a relaxed demeanor, not from lack of concern, but from a surrender of trust that I don't believe I'm currently capable of giving towards performers. This willingness to try new things brought the idea of having actors bring 
wildly different levels of intensity or purposes in characters' intent to each take. This allowed for the editor Jen to use the framing device of a memory in the girlfriend's character's mind and have the same moments play out in different ways as the character remembers them differently. This compromise of space-time and metatextual elements to the storytelling was able to scratch my itch for weirdness in films I want to be a part of, as if to prove the phrase, if you love something set it free and if it loves you it will return, my surrendering of the forced surface level eccentricities allowed for a gratifying excitement of having that aspect surface naturally as a point of collaboration. It's a level of joy I have not felt before in filmmaking. The use of these extra takes as non-linear storytelling became something I employed for my submitted edit of the film, and the framing device of a memory being rewritten was the idea I highlighted in my choice to progressively stylize the visuals and audio of my edit as the film progresses. As an editor, this new approach to procuring material to work with also served to revitalize my editing attitude, as rather than assembly of long since decided pieces into their correct place, akin to IKEA furniture construction, the edit process was now a game of fun, experimentation and play, with various options to coverage, performance and action with next to no constraint on how it's been presented beyond my own desire to justify it. I was an active editor with a creative voice. This is much more preferable to the constrained environment I made for myself in instances of being writer, director and editor in previous projects. Discovering just how exciting and surprising it can be to not have strict guidelines or deeply revised concepts before picking up the camera became a large proponent of my methodology in the next project and submission, the experimental film. I was to pick a subject and decide the most surface level concepts and justifications for my footage, making a conscious decision to commit the cardinal sin of filmmaking and fix it in post. Not for lack of preparation, but in a leap of faith and exercise in discomfort. With the understanding that my research and education were nowhere near the level to be making definitive statements on areas of inequity and injustice, like I one day hope to achieve through my filmmaking, I also entered the final project simultaneously being invigorated by a new and exciting way to approach filmmaking. I wanted to strip back my approach, nearly totally. As a person, I'm fascinated by water. I don't know why and that's perfect. With no plan, I decided my next film would be about water. My experimentation I wanted to work on was the idea of approaching filmmaking in, to an attempt to coin a phrase, an anti moibridgian way. The purpose of Horse in Motion was to capture a subject's form with a level of exposition that the unassisted human eye would be impossible to achieve. I would only be collecting footage of water in ways I'm familiar with it. I walked from my flat to campus, filming each canal, puddle, cloud, drip, pond, and otherwise water-centric aspect of the world around me. I didn't aim to comprehensively capture a subject, rather I exhibited as I naturally would, and it easily presented itself. I decided on the format of presentation being something like a filmic collage, an array of formats showing water. One segment of the film's visuals is very literally a collage, the water cycle as taught to high school level students presented through stock images of water contorted to represent other forms. A snowflake and painted stream were amalgamated into raindrops formed from a cloud made of ice onto a mountain constructed from images of hot water boilers and a garden sprinkler. This established a pseudo-educational tone, especially accompanied by some fictional narration referencing a scout performing reconnaissance on water. As we moved into the second section, we shift from stock images of water to collected stock footage of water. Visually degraded, and then on a level of the video's metadata specifically corrupted, this sequence had video elements bleed into one another with obscured start and end points. This was done to lend to a feeling of imperceptibility, and a shift from the organisation of the first sequence. The audio includes a second scout's report talking about how, when accounting for ice as a form of water, the scout is technically surrounded by it. This lends to the thought that the attempt to survey the water as a subject has taken a turn for hostility. The sequence then continues with overlapping audio of water facts such as the percentage of water in organs, beverages, as well as my personal life memories that in some way include water. This maintains the educational premise but also shifts away from the idea of an accurate and total encapsulation of a subject. The final section of footage is of a bath being filmed as recorded by a 360 degree camera, edited and stylized beyond all recognizability to resemble the creation of the universe, development of planet earth, and the evolution of organisms as facilitated by water. This is all done with so little focus on actually conveying that chronology it serves to be the end to an attempt to study water. 
The final account from the fictionalized scout is not only barely audible, but the dialogue speaks manically about how with an obfuscation of truth and bias, nearly everything around the scout himself included is water. Music is the only accompanying sound as the film plays out to a title card before ending. Having completed the experimental film, I'm very satisfied. I achieved my main goal of creating something with only first takes and minimal effort to convey a message, and as it stands, I find it hard to word and elucidate what it is about the project that appeals to me. Ultimately, that was my aim, and I am very pleased to be un unable to evaluate my work. I set out with a mindset of equating a narrative fiction film to the performance of an animal in a circus. They're forced and trained to perform feats of wonder for the amusement of a crowd. There's not a lot of compassion for the animals that make up the show, and most audiences leave with a distorted view of what the world outside the big top tent is like. I then draw another allegorical link between documentary filmmaking to a museum's exhibited artefacts. There are more educational motivations and an academic desire to inform, but the exhibition is not without sanitation. The animals are stuffed and the weapons are behind glass. That's not to mention the unaddressed biases involved with the perspective of those writing placards of information for items in the museum or sourcing foreign objects for the museum in the first place. As opposed to these perspectives of how film and other methods of experiential audienceship can be compared, with A Scout's Guide to Water, I hope to emulate the approach of a safari. The subject has the autonomy of showing itself to viewers and at no point is attempted to make its display of content feel comfortable or natural. This is the level of depth and critique of standard filmmaking I felt equipped to make. In conclusion, I feel that regarding my desire to create a chronology of my ideas as they develop from prompt to hand in, I've managed to wholly observe the process, allowing me to internalize the steps made during this reflection. I believe through my storytelling module, I was able to orient myself as I stood when entering the master's studies with work done to find an authorial voice. I also think that the personal introspection I went through was not only fruitful, but necessary. To go into the group film project, not without reservations about offering my work up to alteration, but still with the bravery to allow myself to be corrected and criticised is something I'm quite proud of. The result of this discomfort was worth it when my collaborators did nothing but enthuse my confidence in my peers and relieve me of the belief that only I can pull off my ideas. In fact, my ideas can be elevated when I stop restraining them to being just that, mine. With this orientation of storytelling, awareness from my research of humbling collaboration, I believe my work done for the final project in experimental film was possibly as good as I could have done it. To date in my two years of college, three years of undergraduate studies and six projects in total while doing the masters, all as a film student, A Scout's Guide to Water may be my favourite of the films I've made. If a filmmaker is only as good as their last film, I feel I'm progressing to my next steps with an internalised and demonstrated confidence.